Times Influence. Food is the spice of life. And the food and beverage industry has seen an unprecedented growth in the past few years. Keep the momentum going, Franchise India organized its 7th edition of Indian Restaurant Congress, inviting various restaurant owners, executive chefs, F&B directors and new age entrepreneurs who are looking to start a restaurant business. Themed hashtag experience, the two-day forum connected more than 500 F&B brands and top restaurant entrepreneurs under one roof. Today morning I went back seven years when we did the first show. And you know, somebody had then asked me, is there really, the industri is there really an industry in the restaurants? Uh, I mean, you know, the way we just some odd bunch of restauranteurs, do, do you call us an industry? And I can today proudly say that you're really the biggest industry that retail is seeing today. So I think the competition is certainly very fierce, but it's certainly one of the best times the industry has ever seen. And I think it's kudos and hard work to all of you who've been out there and been doing uh, bringing new changes and uh, bringing new uh, ways of working, bringing new innovative ideas into the restaurant industry and actually brought the industry on a global flavor. So Chef Talks is an interesting aspect of the Indian Congress which talks about food from the perspective of the creator. Actually the food world from the perspective of the creator. And uh, you know there are, uh, like I say, there is uh, a food brand would look at food a certain way, a chef would look at food a certain way. I, and I, not because I'm a chef, I'm just saying that we are, uh, food's our baby, it gets created in our hands and hence the way we look at food is also important and it's very important for the world to know how we look at food and that's where Chef Talk kind of rightly fits in, giving, uh, uh, giving us an opportunity to, to talk about our relationship to food and the world an opportunity to understand our relationship to food. The event started with the inaugural session discussing issues affecting the restaurant industry and how to make India a coffee country. Indian food industry, the ent entire Indian hospitality industry is producing almost 2% of the GDP of this nation. 2%, that's a huge number considering that seven years ago we weren't even considered an industry. We're the youngest country in the world. 60% of our population is below 35, which means that the restaurant industry has got the largest potential database of people that any country's ever seen in the past five decades. So you have to create concepts that focus on the millennials. The millennials are the future. Any restaurant company that wants to thrive and go forward in the next few years has to develop concepts for it. That does not mean you only build pubs. It means you build, in, build innovation into your model. You come up with uh, high energy spaces or you come up with fresher concepts, fresher innovative ideas that really make these millennials stay back. I personally feel that another mega trend that's coming up is that of Indian restaurant companies going overseas. You know, I've always believed from the core of my heart that Indian food is the most sophisticated cuisine in the world. It's got unbelievable culinary philosophy. It's got unbelievable depth. It's got unbelievable variety. Every few kilometers, every state has its own food. It's outstanding, but nobody knows about it. Most of the world still thinks of us as greasy takeaway, and we gotta change that. Barring the UK, no other country considers Indian as a predominant destination for eating out on a daily basis. No other country, and we gotta change that. And the way to do that is to repackage it, to rethink it. If you want them to wake up and, and literally understand our food, we gotta modernize it. We gotta make it look better, we gotta make it taste authentic, but come up with a fresher way of present presentation, more innovation, coming up with, you know, I hate the word fusion because it could lead to confusion, but definitely make it more progressive. 
I have huge hopes for our cuisine. I think we have the most amazing cuisine in the world. And through the efforts of most of the people in this room, if we put our minds together, we'll be able to create something truly magical and make it one of the dominant cuisines in the world. The ratio of coffee to tea consumption in India is 1 is to 16. And if you take just North India, that ratio becomes 1 is to 60. Just think about it. When you think of tea, immediately Darjeeling tea comes to mind, Assam tea comes to mind. When you think of coffee, there's nothing equivalent which immediately jumps to mind unless you're a South Indian who's used to Narasu coffee and Kothas coffee. But otherwise, you think of Starbucks and Cafe Coffee Day. So far, India coffee has not been branded. And for the first time, we have taken an initiative to brand coffee along geographical lines. So there are 15 different geographical varieties of coffee in India, starting from Kur coffee, Monsoon Malabar, uh, you know, Baba Budan, who brought the coffee beans to India. Our mission is to try and see, can we give pure filter coffee? Can we create a new category of Indian kapi or Indian pure filter coffee spread across the country? We are starting with the brewing machine model where we are approving brewing machines. Uh, we've got one of the best quality labs in the country for coffee. And we are approving a bunch of co coffee machines which will then be branded with the India coffee branding. My mother tells me that India got into the tea habit because the Brits gave tea free at every street corner and made India a tea country. My challenge is, can I make India a coffee country and enhance the consumption of coffee in India. Now who doesn't enjoy that special dinner date? The next session talked about a winning dining experience strategy that would attract the millennial demographic with the introduction of best of class service to impress customers. You thought of Mama Goto nine years ago. Yeah. And we are discussing today that fine dining and fun dining and a new concept emerging. So what, what was the thought at nine years ago when you thought when good meal meant five stars? Um, <clears throat> nine years ago when we conceptualized Mama Goto, um, I, I had just returned back from London because I used to live there. Um, what I saw then in the market was predominantly, you know, there was no Asian cafe as such. Everything was always pizza, pizza pasta, it was more casual. When you looked at Asian food, it was always either in a hotel or it was a restaurant with led, red lanterns, very boring. Again, there was no fun in dining out, right? So we, f we felt at that time that there was an opportunity in the market uh, to create an environment that was casual, that was affordable, that was accessible, uh, and create then obviously the food that went along with it, uh, which was again approachable, um, you know, people could relate to it. And uh, what we try to do is obviously try and give good quality food, uh, consistent food, um, take it out of a formal um, atmosphere, put it into a fun atmosphere. How did you think of creating a fun dining atmosphere at, say, an airport lounge? I mean, uh, you usually don't associate dining with airport lounges. We wanted to basically make airports a place where you have unexpected F&B experiences there. You know, you, it's somewhere where you wouldn't expect uh, to get, say, the best quality uh, meal there. So I think it's about going out, creating things which are a bit different, a bit unexpected. People don't expect to find that in that environment. Uh, for example, uh, how to get a five-star dining experience in a very casual atmosphere. That's unexpected. That captures people's imagination. Similarly, I think in a lounge atmosphere, go out, create that F&B experience. That really is capturing people's imagination. It's creating something which is a little bit out of the ordinary. What is fun dining according to you? I think fun dining is essentially, um, for, for a guest, it's a 60 or a 120 minute vacation. You go out to a restaurant or you go out to a bar, you really want an overall great experience and it's like a mini holiday. Uh, and I think the whole bucket of what constitutes value, fun, experience has to be assessed, right? It's, it's also got, uh, relevant what occasion you're going for, not in terms of a birthday or something, but is it lunch, is it dinner, is it in between, are you meeting a date, are you going with family, 
but essentially, irrespective of that, that the, the whole um, sum of experiences, the look of the place, the location, the, is the concept different? I mean, serious restauranteurs try not to replicate, but try and stand out by guessing um, on the aspiration value of the guest and guessing just five minutes ahead of the curve. You worked with a five-star hotel and then moved out to open your own chef-driven space. How is, explain to us the experience of working both sides and the mindset of uh, serving guests in a different atmosphere. I've worked in Igis in Singapore. We, we were number 26 in Asia 50 best, number one in Asia, uh, and then I moved to Dubai. So in 2014, when I moved there, uh, all prices dropped, blah, 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 everything happened. It was an 18 million dirham restaurant, seats 400 people, and we barely got 50 people coming in. And it was very fine, it's super fine. You, you, you get top service, everything. It was in a hotel, a five-star hotel, valet service, everything. So it, it struck me, you know, as a chef, I've, I've trained all doing fine dining. So what, what is this? I, I cook well, I, 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 my operations are running very well. So what is it? What do people want? The restaurant business is already so difficult. People, makes it, people make it more difficult. It is very important to not make fun dining a frivolous affair. affair. Choose, your, uh, choose your acts well. Like what, what is it that's going to make you stand out as a serious dining place, yet a fun dining atmosphere? You've been doing it for over the years. What is your take on this? So we had a restaurant called the Yum Yum Tree, which we opened in... We had three zones. We had a fun dining zone with a conveyor belt, we had a fine dining zone, and we had a bar. What we noticed is that about 80% of our audience was only interested in the fun dining zone. They were interested in the area where there were lots of people, you couldn't get a table, um, they only you know, wanted to come there, um, the pr food was well-priced, we didn't even have backrests in that, in that zone. And with Yum Yum Cha, we decided to focus on that aspect. Um, now, we took a different approach where we decided to take out the frills from dining. The idea was to try and bring in that experience of a closed space, a space where you can eat every single day. Celebrating exemplary work in the restaurant business, we bring you the Indian Restaurant Congress Awards after the break. Day two saw sessions that were out of the box and extremely relevant for the restauranteur of today. The next panel deliberated on what will keep the diners drooling in 2017 and the constituents of a superfood menu that will help build a customer connect. What do you think, for you, what is a superfood that you want to celebrate and do you see that these are going to be forming a trend-setting, uh, you know, part in, in our menus, uh, you know, in the coming years. Yes, indeed. Uh, I mean, take for example, Alsi, now called flax seed. Until a few years ago, nobody perhaps in their right minds would have it unless they were forced to. But today it's one of the hottest superfoods being sold in all supermarkets, hotels, restaurants, because it has those values which will the focus has been on well-being for quite some time now, but celebrating it with food is something, so this is something which celebrates celebrating wellness with food. Flexi, is, and it's here to stay. Uh, like I said, it's available commercially, it's being used in, as ingredients in restaurants, breakfast, salad bars, and uh, this, is what, this is what it is. Yeah. Um. For me, I think in the, in the UK and abroad, I, I'm not sure about India at the moment, turmeric has become huge. Haldi is like, haldi latte, this latte, that latte. I mean, we have been using turmeric for generations for anything from wedding to any festivals, any, anything, and food. And um, a publisher came to me and said, Romy, can you write a book on turmeric? I said, Every food in India, we in households put turmeric in it. The turmeric is, is has become so so huge, and as a, and spices, I think it's 
there are so many healing process in them that if you take all the spices, they have so many, um, you know, values of, of, of things. And to understand, I think, for me to write about turmeric, I'm quite excited about it. I think that is, for me, is a superfood. Okay. Chef Alex? Yeah, you see, I think, for me, everything started really with the journey of exp trying to understand what are the ingredients available in India, because I have only traveled to India six years ago. I went to Goa, and that's uh, already it, what I saw about India. Uh, and then when I came, I wanted to see, we wanted to write the menu, and I wanted to know what, what is there. And, you know, we came across the millets, all the different rice, all the grains, you know, all the stuff which we in Europe not really used because we just, you know, think uh, sometimes whatever we have around the corner is what we want to work with. And then, um, you know, you start working with this and all of a sudden you start to understand the ingredients because you want to know about it. If you look at millets, you know, we fly quinoa all across the world from Peru, but when you have amrant in India, which is one of your oldest ingredients. So I said, why do I have to fly the one from Peru? So I think that's where the whole thought process comes in the superfood comes exactly uh, with it because that's all the old ingredients which have been, well, the world is, in, is a system, right? So eventually, many, 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 many hundreds of thousands of years back, something has started to grow for a reason in a typical area because of a typical climate. So the people in this area who were the workers, who were the hunters, whatever, were living from these ingredients which has all the proteins and all the, you know, yeah, proteins which you need in that area. And I think these days now we need to go back and try to understand why is actually the black peas only growing in Ladakh and not somewhere else. So I think that's where the whole thought comes from. And that I think it's in relation to the superfood uh, because that's all the ingredients we haven't really looked at. And uh, once you start looking at it, you will understand why it's called superfood because it has all the proteins and all the nutrition and whatever you would like to have. Right, chef. I think uh, I agree with uh, all of them. What Chef Moser is talking about is uh, the bi biodynamic uh, uh, growth patterns and consumption patterns, which is uh, uh, a growing, uh, which is growing at a very, very fast pace, and uh, people are accepting it uh, with open arms. Um, when we talk about spooper foods, primarily what comes to our mind is uh, broccoli, quinoa, olive oil. Um, I think uh, Chef Romy very well put up turmeric. Um, people are talking about turmeric latte these days. We have grown up, you know, our grannies have been feeding us with uh, haldi ka dood. And it is, it is a superfood. You talk about um, uh, rajgiri, which is amaranth. Uh, very, very, you know, very high uh, antioxidants very rich uh, in terms of uh, proteins, uh, amino acids, uh, very rich on all three vitamins, vitamin A, B, C, um, desi ghee, amla. They are all superfoods and they are packed. They are power packed with uh, various nutrients. I think India is a land where uh, we get everything and uh, we do not utilize it in our day-to-day uh, -day, uh, eating habits. Two days of networking, discussions and sharing of ideas, the Indian Restaurant Congress came to a close with the much-awaited award ceremony, recognizing those who are trying to make a mark in the food and beverage industry. We will begin with our first set of awards. Best American Style Diner in India, Broster Chicken. On to the best national restaurant chain of the year, Barbecue Nation Hospitality Limited. And the last award in this segment is for the Food Entrepreneur of the Year. And the award goes to Mr. Varun Chaudhary, Executive Director, CG Corp Global. And the next one is for the best regional restaurant bar of the year south. Three dots and a dash.
Moving on to the next one. Best Indian Cuisine Restaurant of the Year South. Maplai. The Best Caterer of the Year Award goes to Foodling Banquets and Catering India Private Limited. The next one is for the Regional Restaurateur of the Year North, Mr. Vikrant Batra, Director, Cafe Delhi Heights. Emerging Restaurateur of the Year, Mr. Swadeep Popli, Founder and CEO, The Chatter House. Restaurant of the Year, Mr. Ayush Gupta and Ms. Arushi Gupta, Directors, Elysium Entertainment Private Limited. And the final award for the evening, Restaurant Icon of the Year, Mr. Prayank Sukhija, owner, Laziz Affair Group. A big round of applause for the Restaurant Icon of the Year. I would love to invite all the winners tonight to please come up on stage and let's take a nice big group photo. It's a great platform for uh, all, uh, especially the upcoming uh, restaurants to be a part of and to also look from well-established uh, restaurants and get inspired and also get yourself visibility on a national level. It is a big platform for all the restaurateurs and hoteliers where they can discuss about the ideology, about the problems, about the future market, each and everything, so that they can come together and discuss about the future of the hospitality. Partnered by Times Influence.